A defensive layer is comprised of a set of security attributes that provide an obstacle to an adversary attack and thereby protect the asset or assets. Attributes are either tied to a known standard or must be identified as being above a known standard or no standard exists. This will assist the commander with decisions on mitigation measures later in the process. Most standards are found in the Physical Security Regulations and the USACE Protective Design Center. There are two types of defensive layers. You have land-based defensive layers and you have waterside defensive layers. Currently at this time, we're not using waterside defensive layers. Navy approved barriers are the only approved barriers to be used on the waterside. And currently the Corps of Engineers is not utilizing those types of defensive layers. If this, if a commander deems it enough risk that he requires that defensive layers be put in, then Navy approved barriers may be incorporated in the future. Land-based layers. Land-based defensive layers may include attributes such as a personnel barrier, a vehicle barrier, access control, surveillance system, and guards. To be considered a land-based layer, a personnel barrier must be present. Note, if a layer includes more than one of the same defensive attribute, for example, two vehicle barriers that an attacker has to cross in sequence, two sets of fences meant to bar personnel on foot, or two surveillance systems that cover different areas, a new defensive layer should be created to capture it. The defensive layer attributes determine what your rating for that layer is. So the ratings could be O, which means you have no defensive attributes for that defensive layer, which would mean that the defensive layer does not meet any kind of standard. Then you have A through H, which means you have some kind of combination. A would be you have all five of the attributes, personal barriers, vehicle barriers, access control, surveillance, and guard forces, which would give you a pretty strong defensive layer, which you may have combinations in between. And there's a matrix that has been developed as part of the CRMD methodology, and the different rating levels from A to H give you different security configurations. For each land-based defensive layer identified in the facility sketch, complete the Implementation Supplement Form 1B questionnaire set. In doing so, you will provide the following. Layer numbers that match the facility sketch. For example, L1 for land-based layer 1. Descriptions that provide relevant information about the defensive layer to include any defining features not captured in the questionnaires. Assets and subcomponents protected by the defensive layer, as well as the left bank and or right bank approaches from which it provides protection. Please note that the asset names should match those listed in the Implementation Supplement Form 1A. Responses to questionnaires on the attributes implemented within the defensive layer. This process must be repeated for each individual defensive layer. And remember that while layers may have one or more defensive attributes, it does not have more than one instance of the same type of defensive attribute. For example, a land-based layer may have a personnel barrier and a vehicle barrier, but it may not have two personnel barriers. Like land-based defensive layers, waterside defensive layers also have attributes which include swimmer or diver barriers, vessel barriers, and surveillance systems. To be considered a waterside layer, either a swimmer, diver barrier, or vessel barrier must be present, and the barrier must meet Navy requirements for protectiveness. Using Form 1C, identify each waterside defensive layer for the facility and record the details of each on a single Form 1C set. Number and describe the layers to match the number and name in the facility sketch. Using the assets and components identified in Form 1A, list the critical facility assets and components that the defensive layer provides protection against for attacks originating from both upstream and downstream. Repeat this process and complete all forms for each defensive layer. For each waterside defensive layer identified in the facility sketch, complete the Implementation Supplement Form 1C questionnaire set. As noted with Form 1B, for land-based defensive layer, Form 1C requires layer numbers that match the facility sketch, the relevant descriptions, upstream and downstream approaches from which the defensive layer provides protection, and questionnaire responses. Also, the process would have to be repeated for each waterside layer. However, 
I would like to note that it is not very common for a project to have water side defenses due to the requirements to meet the standards. There may be additional defensive layers that protect all vital components of the project and that must be defeated in order for an attack to succeed. These defensive layers form an integral part of the facility security posture and may be capable of responding to terrorist attacks and other emergencies. Some civil works projects have guard forces and those guard forces may be internal to an asset, they may be external, they may have reaction forces. Reaction forces are dedicated to reacting to an attack or some kind of situation. Internal guard forces, they don't leave their post. So if in answering the questions for guard forces, you respond that a guard is internal, such as someone who checks an ID at a gate, that person cannot leave their post to react to or respond to an incident. That's why you would identify specific response forces within your guard force team that their specific duty is to react to an incident. Each facility may have a single reaction force, but multiple response forces, depending on agreements and memorandums already in place. To provide details on the reaction and response forces, complete Implementation Supplement Form 1D, Response General Questions, and Forms 1E. The reaction force requires a single Form 1D. However, the response force's completion of the response general questions plus a completed Form 1E for every response force identified in response general questions. Once established, the defensive layer's information lays the foundation on which you will base your recommendations. Once you have completed the implementation supplement forms 1B and 1C, you verify this information during the site visit and update it accordingly. Once you have completed the Implementation Supplement Forms 1B and 1C, you verify this information during the site visit and then update accordingly. Following the site visit, you enter updated Forms 1B and 1C into the Common Risk Model for Dams module. You will make these recommendations by identifying the defensive attributes that should be upgraded or added in order to reduce the project's vulnerability to threats.